Okay, so we said that this was going to be a marketing discussion of this whole elections, not politics. It is really difficult to avoid the political aspect of it. So if it occasionally comes up, it's okay. But there is a request for everybody to try to keep it focused on marketing and kind of the secular aspects of it. Uh, the narrative that I thought, the kind of the narrative arc for this conversation, I was thinking that maybe it could be focused on the sales cycle. I thought we can start with the budgeting. Marketing budget is always a pain in the neck. Justifying it is even worse. The ROI of marketing is so untractable. Uh, but then the funding process for these things is its own thing. You're not really getting a budget. You try to raise funds. The co com competitive strategy, obviously, this thing is incredibly competitive. Uh, value proposition, messaging strategy, what are the target geographies, polling, the impact of polling on fundraising, the impact of polling on what you may or may not uh, achieve, and then the strategy for email marketing and physical mail marketing. And, and Mike uh, has personal experience on that. And then uh, the loyalty programs that these marketing, uh, these tech political campaigns do. And then, of course, Doug also mentioned uh, share of search. So with that, where do you guys want to take it first? Uh, I'll start with Mike and Doug, since you are you agreed to formally be on the panel, and then everybody else is on the less official panel. But uh, please feel free to think that you are on it. So we, we want it to be very interactive. So with your first question on uh, marketing spend and, and budget, uh, and, and you're right, this is uh, I mean this is not like you know marketing a product. And matter of fact, we're at a stage now where uh, they're to be a product recall in progress uh, <laughs> in the last week. But I was taking a look at some numbers. And uh, this year uh, for uh, the US, over $11 billion has been spent overall. Wow. Uh, federal. Uh, for uh, That's both houses, you know, Senate, uh, representative and president. President is north of $1 billion. And that one billion has predominantly been spent in third. Well, has only been spent in thirteen states, with about sixty percent uh, tilting towards Biden, and the remaining forty percent uh, to support Trump. Of that one billion in the thirteen states, ninety percent of that uh, has been in the swing states: Florida, Pennsylvania, Michigan, North Carolina, Wisconsin, and Arizona. So I took a look at the numbers. And along the lines of what Doug was saying a few minutes ago, in terms of this being very different from anything else you take a look at, and I asked, okay, myself, when I saw your questions, what is the right amount to spend? Mm -hmm. And I think an election is, from a marketing point of view, and the marketing investment and the return you're looking for, I think it's right up there with what is a fair price for a cure for cancer? <laughs> and in this case, with politicians, um, what is the value and the price of obtaining power for four years? What price tag do you put on that? Pretty clearly, since uh, the ad spend in 2020 is approximately 50% higher than it was in 2016, um, people are very happy to pay um, uh, a very high price uh, because when you get down to it in this election, or in any kind of election from a marketing point of view, number one, market share leader is the only thing that counts. Number two, you get nothing. Number two, market share. It's worth absolutely zero. Um, so I wouldn't be at all surprised if um, uh, the presidential election, you know, $11 billion, um, I think either side, if they win, either side would say it is worth it. I wouldn't be at all surprised if right now the Trump side is saying we should have raised more money. Mm. Um, and uh, I'm from what I've read too, although this isn't presidential, but locking down uh, in the Senate in Georgia, those other two seats for either Republicans or Democrats, uh, the expectation is that over $100 million will be spent by each party. And again, because that's what, can, you know, the control of uh, the Senate. So from, from a marketer's point of view, if Biden prevails, uh, I think the Democratic Party would say uh, we spent the right amount of money. <laughs> but sounds like you would spend more if you needed to. <laughs> well, I think Trump, I know from uh, the emails I got from his campaign, uh, which were uh, tantamount to a ramping up in the last couple of weeks to uh, 
hearing water dripping out of a tap uh, every 15, 18 seconds, you're getting a truck email. They were very desperate for, for raising cash because they spent, if there's one issue in terms of um, financing of the marketing, um, it looks like they spent um, a little too early, which is why I think Brad Parscale as the digital marketing manager was moved aside and there wasn't a, enough left in uh, the war chest to spend up when uh, the Republicans saw, and I think they were surprised by the amount of money raised by uh, Biden's campaign. I just don't think they were prepared for that level of, if you will, competitive spend. But they, they obviously weren't able, they were raising some money, they weren't able to raise enough money. So when the dust settles and the campaigns are evaluated, I really think you're gonna have a Republicans um, from a marketing point of view, taking a, a look at the kind of questions you're asking, did we spend enough on the right things in the right places? Was it a matter of overall spend or, or was it a matter of the allocation of the spend or something that had nothing to do with the marketing of it? That's really interesting, Mike. So I think it's really interesting that as you're talking, the thing that strikes me that's so weird about it is um, it's also done without a central marketing authority or a central budget authority, that the reality of the budget is that um, two groups pay for it, you know, kind of like grassroots and at least, at least two. <laughs> yeah, but you know, but basically it's, you know, it's kind of weird because the budget gets pulled out of the population for this. So at some level, you know, however that happens, it, we won't want to talk about that. So that's one of those sausage making things we don't want to see but mm -hmm. however the money gets pulled out of the population which is weird i mean as a marketer you'd never do that go to your customers and ask them for the budget to market to them but <laughs> i'm not sure uh, um, so it's just kind of an, it's interesting it also makes me wonder are those budgets market controlled at all or is that part of the problem we have with political spending is that because it's based on whatever i can raise is right um, well, well it is because okay. we were we were talking about it this morning is that it's not like you can say if we win we're going to have a control of 16 trillion dollars and three percent of that is a good allocation of marketing right like we do with revenue right. okay we're gonna right. have a two billion dollar revenue you know five percent if we are doing you know if we are seriously oem we go this way if you're seriously mm -hmm. direct sales we go this way mm -hmm. and you have a bit of a range that you can you know you don't have that so how much how much is are you willing to spend you know is mm -hmm. is, is is 10 billion dollars too much is 100 billion dollars too much or is it all okay as long as you can raise it and then related to that is a lot of the dollars were wasted very clearly mm -hmm. they you know sometimes you exhaust the the you know the the, the audience is especially the out-of-state money that poured into these swing states, yeah, it's yeah. really questionable whether they move the needle at all. So, Well, I know on the Democratic side, there's some real questions about, you know, the. Uh, so I got the other stream of emails. And um, um, my frustration with the email marketing there was I would get the, get the big, kind of pinging back and forth the emails from various Democratic, uh, you know, operations. One would be, oh my God, the world's falling apart. We need your money now. The other one would be, we're having huge success. Everything is going great. <laughs> we need your money now. And it would be like, and I'd get like, I mean, in my inbox, I'd have, have them one right after another. And you look at it and you're like, what are these guys thinking? Does nobody coordinate this? I mean, something works. So I'm not going to, you know, I guess I could, you know, take the old, well, it kind of worked. But at some level, it sure seems silly. Um, but especially I was thinking those races to like unseat McConnell, you know, right. um, that my uh, I have a brother, who, you know, I talked about it quite a bit. And we agreed. It's just like, what a waste of money for the Democrats, because there was really no chance of unseating McConnell. No, that's know? right. And it wasn't but, a question of money. Right there, you know? Yeah, I think many of these is really the question of the candidate rather than the money mm -hmm. and have somebody who's high powered who can actually go toe to toe. And uh, I, I wasn't seeing that. I, you're, you're right. I, th I thought it. So the other relevant thing to budgeting was a lot of money was raised at the last minute. Mm -hmm. And 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 what I was, uh, the, you know, the little uh, study I did said that these campaigns didn't know what to do with that money. Mm -hmm. They felt obligated to use it. 
but they didn't have time to go and devise a new plan. So they just reinforced the existing plans. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that meant that if the money was being wasted, it was just going to be even more of it wasted. TV is a hungry beast. It'll, uh, it'll eat up all your money if you want to. Um, I always <laughs> loved it. Well, yeah, clients would come to me when I was, you know, I was, I, if you may not know, I owned a TV ad agency for a long time. They come in, they say, well, how much, you know, how much can I spend? I'm like, don't ask that question. You know, <laughs> TV is really one of these places where whatever you want to spend, we'll figure it out. You know, we're happy to take your money, but, um, right. you know, Volus asks over in the chat. When it comes, when it comes What's that, Michael? Sorry, one of the unusual things when it comes to money and one perspective uh, or lens that I view this through uh, with the money that is is raised, because most of it is not raised, uh, uh, you know, five dollars, ten dollars at, at a time. The stuff they really take a look at is six digits and north. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, two thoughts I had. Number one, uh, what other endeavor do you know of societally? in which people are asked to make donations for a marketing budget. <laughs> and this is the only one that comes to mind for, for me. Um, and don't the VCs usually turn you down if you say it's for a marketing budget? They're like, no. <laughs> and basically they have uh, a vested, uh, the ones who donate have a vested um, interest in the outcome. And uh, Shaheen will get to that when you talk about value proposition and, and what was uh, at stake. Uh, but I found it interesting too, uh, you know, as you said about, you know, you get to the 11th hour and money's coming in and what do we do with it? It's almost like there's a fire and anyone whose hand is near a tap where there's water is turning it on and let's get the water flowing and someone can figure out what to do with the buckets of water once they get it out of the house. Um, and I, when you think of the pent up anxiety and how much is at stake in this particular um, election for particularly when you think far left uh, and and far right, it gets down again. Uh, when I think of my colleagues who are um, uh, devout uh, capitalists, uh, you know, how much insurance do you want to buy to right. prevent uh, AOC and her friends from having uh, launching uh, creating a U.S. socialism 101? And, and so I think a lot of, at the end is um, trying to uh, cement uh, and, and prevent the fire from spreading. I think another part too, particularly by corporations uh, is under the guise of, mm, we don't know who's gonna win. We have a favorite, but are our favorites not gonna get in? We sure as hell don't wanna look like the enemy to the other guy. So we better dig deep and give uh, him some money. And I view that less as marketing and more as here's a peace offering. So if you do win, you know, hey, remember us? We uh, don't we get a couple of those smoke signals up in the air. I always love those reports that pop out about, you know, this company gave money to Biden or, or to Trump, you know, whatever it was. And half of them ended up being like they gave $16,000. And I'm like, that's not really giving money to a presidential candidate. I mean, for them to even remember that you gave money, I think a million's the number you have to start at, right? Well, I mean, otherwise, yeah. You know. it, it's, it's always surprising to me when I hear these numbers and they look so small. Yeah. And I keep saying, wow, that's a really low price to get that kind of influence. Mm -hmm. Really? Like, you know, 15K? You know, mm -hmm. that's like it, you know, like it's incredible to me that that. So I, I never believe it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, there's a there's a there's a comment in the in the chat box about do these campaigns have a sense of how money correlates with victory? I have a feeling that it does to a point, and then maybe not beyond that. Do they have a feel for where that threshold is? Clearly not. But I, I don't think they do. I think the thing I've been you know there's a lot of discussion in the advertising world about you know does political advertising work of course we always have to make it you know black and white either it works or it doesn't work i uh, mean the true question is what is its role um so in you know advertising is one of the big monies that people spend but if you take the theory that the population is already kind of spread between you know probably 35 percent are going to vote republican no matter what 35 percent are going to vote democrat no matter what the money is spent to really for that narrow market in the middle that is able to be swayed. Um, it's probably also spent to help your 
people who are going to vote for you feel more confident, right? You know, right. avoid that buyer's remorse kind of thing or those uh, cognitive, mm -hmm. whatever that you know, all those kind of psychological things. But the vast, you know, amount of it is probably spent on a very narrow market, which goes back to Valdis's question about the cost of a vote. You know, it depends on how many votes you're looking at. I mean, here a swing of 10 million votes would have been, um, you know, would have changed the result significantly, right? I mean, with with confidence. I don't mean just like eke out a win, but really flip it. So let's see. Um, I don't know, Mike, I can't do it as fast as I want to in my brain. What do you think a billion divided by 10,000 is, or by uh, 10 million is? What are we at? 100? <laughs> yeah, about that, yeah. About 100 bucks a vote. So uh, uh, for what it's worth of all this, I'll just guess that 100 bucks a vote for those, which the minute I get to there, I'm like, that's not bad. That's not that bad, but I don't know. But are you talking about just money going to directly to yeah presidential candidates or other candidates or are you also talking about there's an enormous amount of money in PACs and other right. other indirect contributions so um good, when you like question. you know the, the Shaheen's comment about you know fifteen thousand dollars is pretty cheap to to buy influence but <laughs> maybe they're spending 20 million on indirect channels hmm. what do you think Mike you did the numbers how much of that was in uh, PACs and how much of that was candidate well, the uh, just as uh, I think it was Andrew was just saying, you know, most of it comes through the PACs. Mm -hmm. I think the corporate stuff. Um, uh, my view of it is, you know, they're they're spreading enough around uh, so that um, it's like going to uh, in a way to a, a horse race, or you know, the uh, the fact that you bet on a particular uh, uh, stable um, and, and jockey is as important as which horse wins. And the guys who go up, maybe put down $20 in the horse they think is gonna win and put down $2 on every other horse, just so they can see that they were fair about it. And uh, they're remembered fondly at the end of the race. Um, I, I think the big serious money is the packs. When you talk about the number of votes that mattered right now with the five states in question, there's about 150, 160,000 vote uh, differential from uh, last I checked. Um, and getting to what you know, you were saying, Shaheen, about you know the value of how you measure the effectiveness of marketing. I, I think it's no different than measuring the effectiveness uh, of marketing in a lot of other endeavors. I think it's really difficult. Really hard. <laughs> and you and I've talked about it, and we all know that. Uh, particularly the young ones, and I hope there's no one too young uh, on here, but who come running up and say, oh, you should see the number of click-throughs you've got in the last campaign, or our share of voice is moving north. So those are all in, you know, positive indicators. Uh, but, you know, to the question, can someone prove reasonably or substantiate that uh, the more than $1 billion spent on these two candidates uh, materially led to that outcome? I think the answer is no. And I think it gets back to what we were saying earlier. With so much at stake, not spending money is, is risky if you have a, right. a deep vested interest in the outcome. Right. And how much uh, is, you know, should you invest? Uh, I, I won't mention names, but we all know and have worked with and worked for some dyed in the wool capitalists and free marketers and libertarians. Uh, who are very well off and, uh, you know, view it as if I have to kick in another $100,000 uh, to ensure that I only have to see AOC on Twitter and never in a position of uh, making decisions, I'll put in an extra $100,000. So I, I think with the big, or I mean, take a look at uh, uh, Mike Bloomberg, 100 million bucks going into Florida. Uh, and <laughs> that appears to be a, a marketing spend uh, that had zero return. I'm not sure the ROI there was very good for him. Yeah, exactly. Saying, you know, that, uh, well, I think, you know, it's interesting, because like, you were talking, to, I mean, you rightly observed that ROI here is really difficult because what you are talking about is control of government for four years, not talking about, you know, you're not buying voters as much as you're buying control of government. So it's it's even hard. I mean, this makes it really a fuzzy world of finance because you're kind of, a, you know, there's no real direct connections necessarily. You're investing this thing you have to do up front in order to eventually get what you want at some point. And you're right, you're buying insurance. 
I wonder how much that is. That would be great. I wonder if anybody would know that, you know, out of the big investments in, in the campaign, how much of it is insurance, um, how much of it is buying your own influence, and how much is because you think the candidate's the better guy. Mm -hmm. So a related question is channel. Now that you do have the money, what channels do you use? There's some discussion in the chat room on social media versus direct mail versus physical mail versus mm -hmm. advertising TV. Uh, you know, my experience is that every channel is good for a certain number of uh, audience. And mm -hmm. then beyond that, it, it loses its price performance that you need a mix. That's why you need a mix of channels and between search engine and social media and PR and et cetera, et cetera. What, is, what do you think? What, is, what do you think that mix is changing? Well, you know, I mean, these, the, so the, you know, social media channels, um, I would say this is probably the first campaign where the social media channels have been strong enough for pure spending. You know, there's a lot that happened in 2016 that was social media pass arounds and rumors and where you'd kind of manipulate things by having the most exotic, dramatic thing you could, you know, say, uh, Mike, you're absolutely right. AOC is a, is a classic headline getter for people who are afraid of AOC. Um, you know, uh, Sheldon Adelson gets the Democrats in a, you know, an uproar. George Soros will do, you know, it's like people, you know, right. people do that. But this time, you know, the, the Facebook channel in the last four years really has matured to where you can buy in it. But I didn't see much paid advertising in Facebook, at least in my feed. But that's what's so hard with some of these channels now is how can you evaluate them? And there's no broad reports on it. Um, all that said, all my experience is TV remains the most cost effective way to reach the largest amount of people um, and to do it with persuasion. But, um, you know, that is beginning to really shift. And I don't know, by 2024, we may be in a much different world. This may be the last election where TV has that kind of dominance. We don't know yeah. because there's also a bunch of backlash on social media. Uh, sorry, yeah. Celia, go ahead. I was just going to say, I, there's some other, I think, areas to consider too. Just there's a lot of texting, mm -hmm. and you know, there's the phone banking, right. and there's there was still some canvassing, less so because of COVID. But mm -hmm. you know, not only digital and TV, which is a little more traditional. Mm -hmm. But I mean, of course, you probably have my phone was ringing off the hook, and a lot of texts too. I was surprised. Yeah. Well, I think too that I mean, part of what I looked at with it is somebody asked a question that in chat, I guess that stimulated it for me, which is that channels aren't all equal in terms of message impact either, right? So, I mean, some is the cost of, me, of reaching a person. The other is the value of reaching a person. So, you know, with a good TV ad, they tend to be really compelling. That's nice. With canvassing, the level of value of a contact goes up even more because you have a real person and if that person has a persuasive thing that, um, you know, that, uh, you know, you meet a homeowner and they go, you know what, I'm open to Biden or I'm open to Trump, right? That, that, that shift can be kind of priceless, um, for, you know, within that case. But that's one of the things that's so hard, makes the media world so hard to figure out is what is it that's going to shift that narrow middle, um, maybe, uh, you know, five to 10 million voters overall. Hey, Mike, by the way, you're 150,000. That's really interesting because I think when I did the same kind of calculation in 2016, it was about 110,000 votes would have taken it to Hillary. You know, mm -hmm. that in reality, amongst all these swing states, it's these very narrow slice of votes. that. So then that's really a question of, OK, so now there is money you spend to persuade people. Yeah, there is money you spend to just energize the base and make sure you get out the vote. And then you do the canvassing to actually get out the vote. Although this time around, there were big phone banks trying to persuade mm -hmm. people as well. Like, you know, folks in California calling folks in, you know, some other state in Arizona or people actually driving from, you know, Oregon to Arizona to be on the ground to help. Uh, so those are all different channels of trying to persuade and bring out the vote. But, but at some point it becomes really the question of the candidate, where the decision is made, and there's nothing that's going to change your mind. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it doesn't look to me like these campaigns really get that, 
that they just pile on top of pile on top of something that is just never going to happen. It's no different than some of the you know online advertisings that I get mm -hmm. that you know there's just no way I'm ever going to buy what it is you're peddling. So why are you doing that, right? So that's statistical because you know you're just trying to reach enough people, right? I mean, I mean, I've I've done a lot of the direct marketing, and you know, we meet, you know, we reach a hundred people in one act. We're happy with that. And, mm. You know, think about the god awful telemarketing stuff we get with uh, you know predictive dialers, where they can just fill the dialer up, and if somebody answers, then you put a real person on the phone. But it's cheap to have the dialer going that's around, it. yeah. You know, and you or or spam, yeah. Um, anybody anybody supporting that prince in Nigeria yet? Just you know, one thing. Um, so, got close a couple of times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I um, think look, yeah, actually, I mean, it, it's tricky. Sorry, Mark. Uh, you know, marketing lens of this, Shaheen. Uh, if there is a first and second prize handed out presidential uh, election for uh, number best marketing and second best marketing, I'm not sure either party would qualify mm. to win because I. These were marketing campaigns that were not run by marketers, but marketers were used. Um, I think the um, uh, my experience with Trump's campaign, I have more experience with that uh, since I started getting uh, emails and I made a point of never agreeing to accept texts. Um, but to the point that, you know, Doug raises, at least being here in California, there was no money spent in California on either candidate. So a lot of the marketing I used to hear about, I'd wonder why I'm not seeing anything on Facebook and all this stuff that people are getting worked up about. Well, because no money was being spent here. It was a waste of time spending um, for either uh, I, either party at, you know, in California. And that's why the money went into those 13 states. I do think from you know, what tools are best used from uh, the GOP point of view, Trump, um, you know, I would submit um, there's an argument that uh, Trump was the campaign CMO. Hmm. He likes um, mm -hmm. he likes tactile, personal. There, I can wave, I can touch you. You can touch me. Uh, we can spread germs back and forth. That's what he deems to be most uh, effective. I think the second most, uh, the point Doug that you were making, is the visual. Um, where he um, you know, can be seen on TV, on the debates, and a lot of what he's done, I think the guy's very clever, is getting, if you will, free advertising. Uh, anytime yes. he does something, the cameras are gonna cover it. But I think the third thing, uh, and he said, you know, on a few times when it comes to social media and um, um, uh, his campaign and his being elected, his firm belief, and I can understand why, is that unless he had Twitter, he never would have gotten in in 2016. And the reason being, I think he knows that you can't spend your way to a win. You're influencing people emotionally and people have to get some kind of connection. And he doesn't want to be filtered by anything. And I think that's why he uses um, uh, Twitter. Mm. No one until the last three, four weeks can really stop him in, in what he wants to say. But that is his way of getting around the lamestream media, as he likes to call them, mm -hmm. not worrying about Brad um, uh, Barscale or step ins and just immediately go on to whoever wants to uh, hear his message. Uh, and to that extent, I, I think as far as the rest of the spin goes, very difficult to calibrate and put uh, a figure on what was effective, what was not, because so much, at least with him, depends on satisfying his biases as to what he thinks is fruitful spend. Right. I think also, you know, because I think that's really interesting. And, you know, the, the truth is he's an ideal individual for a Twitter kind of approach, because what he seems to really, really thoroughly know is selling the Trump brand. And he kind of took the, he uses instability to sell it, which is not necessarily mm -hmm. bad. You know, I mean, he uses surprise to sell it, keep us all a little off balance on what he's going to do next. And, you know, it's really, it gets attention and keeps the media focused on him and stuff. The only thing I'll say that he kind of, you know, he suffered from is, I mean, he's an incumbent that didn't, doesn't appear to have, doesn't appear to have been reelected. Um, at some level, he lost some of the power of the bully pulpit. And I don't know if it's from some mistrust of COVID or what it was, 
or just the mere fact that he does he doesn't like that, you know, I'm the sober leader thing. Then that's not really his love, I think, in life. And somehow I feel like he lost a little imagery there that would have, um, you know, other incumbents take more advantage of. So this is a great segue into value proposition because now mm -hmm. we're talking about the product and the products are decidedly very different. <laughs> uh, and, and therefore how you market them must be different. I think that both campaigns ran a really good campaign given what product they were trying right. to sell. Mm -hmm. I kind of thought that from a marketing standpoint, the Trump campaign was more effective than Biden. Mm -hmm. I thought that they took it more seriously. This is sort of the second law of competitive intelligence is whoever takes it more seriously wins. And it seemed to me that the, that the Republicans always seem to take it more seriously for them. For them, it's just the, you know, it's not a debate. It's a, it's a fight. Uh, but let's yeah. translate that to value propositions. What did you guys see in the debate and the emails that you got? Mike, you may want to mention some of the stats of the emails that you received. And sure. let's, let's, well, let's have that discussion. As of, uh, well, I'll give you the numbers. As of uh, just before joining this call, uh, the number keeps going up. Uh, I've received uh, 2,775 emails from the Trump campaign since October of 2019, so 13 months. Uh, and that compares to the Biden campaign, but this is just since August of this year, uh, 87 emails and 122 texts. Now, I think I found interesting, I actually did the count. It's really easy to do the count, but um, in the period August, um, following the first, uh, or, or beginning in August when I started tracking both campaigns, uh, during that period, the 87 emails I got from the Biden campaign, uh, that was outdistanced by a total of a whopping total of 1,572 <laughs> emails during that, that four month period of time from the Trump campaign. Now as to, as to value proposition, and this is, uh, I'll give you my view uh, for, for both parties and who I think their markets are. And I'm trying to, I, I'm not expressing a political leaning one way or another when I, I, I give these views, it's just how I call it. Uh, but I think with uh, Trump, um, he uh, was only interested in two targets, uh, one of which conventional GOP, um, uh, uh, free capital markets, um, uh, libertarians and the like, and he never tried to market to them. They, they were just a, a car that came along with a sidecar that came along with a motorcycle. He principally aimed at uh, it was a completely populist aim, in, in my view, at disaffected Americans, largely non-urban. Uh, and his value proposition is pretty simple. Make America great again and keep America great again. Now, what, is, what did he mean and what did he appeal to by make uh, America great again? In, in my view, it was stuff that was very light on policy, but um, very heavy on, um, you know, let's get back to America being the land of plenty where there are lots of manufacturing jobs and where uh, farmers are making money where they're not having banks foreclosing their farms. Let's get back to where everyone speaks English and you understand that everyone is, is kind of largely white and you don't have all of these immigrants coming in, taking uh, jobs. And he very strongly uh, appealed to um, that um, view of, of many Americans, you know, resolutely who, who fear that um, the America that they grew up in is changing and could go away. And I think many of them are very frightened by that and protective. And he's the guy, it, it almost sounds odd to state this, but um, it's like an amped up version, uh, Trump's version of Mr. Smith goes to Washington. <laughs> uh, he is the freedom fighter coming in to uh, you know, help these guys out. There's one market, uh, and that's the market he kept selling. There's one market opportunity, one segment that where I think he made a severe blunder and I think to the point that Doug raised, I didn't see any attempt to offer anything to, and that was the small number of swing voters. Uh, you know, for those who aren't died in the wool, get me my mega uh, cap and my mega mug, and away I go. And uh, the hell with face mask. I know, by the way, does anybody have a, 
a spare, um, uh, you know, 22 kicking around I can strap over my shoulder. He didn't care to appeal to any of them. I think his view was there's enough in the base to win this thing. All I got to do is get him out. Biden's value proposition, not to be crass, uh, but uh, he was in the role of exorcist to get rid of the Antichrist. <laughs> and he was, I think, primarily appealing to those who more than dislike Trump, we're afraid of Trump, uh, are unnerved by what he has been doing to the country, uh, how the U.S. is perceived on the international stage. And uh, he was basically selling, I'm a reasonable guy. You have a choice between me, Mr. You know, reasonable, I'm a little older, or you can have, you know, uh, this guy, the Linda Blair of 2020, with his head <laughs> spinning around, spewing vomitus out. Uh, the other interesting target or value proposition I thought for Biden, and it may explain, because I know you and I have exchanged emails before on this, um, or messages, uh, Shaheen, on this with, uh, as you said earlier, uh, conservatives being amped up and uh, I think the Dems being kind of soft. I market he was going to was the centrist Democrats. Mm -hmm. And he had to go just enough to the left, to the progressive, to say, look, I, I see you. I see you. But I think he really, in his campaign, had to thread the needle uh, in that he's got to get enough of the left to make them feel that there is an opportunity, there is value for them in a, a new or beginning of a new progressive society, a new progressive U.S. But if he over tilted in that direction, he loses uh, the uh, center left and center right vote. So I saw them each is having two markets. I thought Biden did the best at, it's like a Lexus. It's not a Mercedes Benz. It's not a BMW. It doesn't have the styling of either, but you know something, it, it's reliable. And I think that's what he was selling. And just the one mis mistake I think that Trump made uh, is uh, if he was making an appeal to the swing voters, I miss that on cable news. Yeah, I think the news, yeah, I mean, what, what came through the news for him was, I mean, it didn't have anything for the swing voters. And that, yeah, pretty serious. I'm trying to think more about, um, I, I was going to go back, there's a, um, a sociologist, Arlie Hochschild, who spent a bunch of time in Lake Charles. Um, she's a sociologist, but very environmentally tapped in. And she went into Lake Charles, Louisiana, and spent a bunch of time with residents there trying to understand them. And as a real sociologist, going like, because it, it, it's an environmentally destroyed area. And she went in with this question of like, why would they vote for Trump? And came away with some pretty interesting understandings. And mm. for as far as kind of you know, Trump's base in the Biden base, she ended up talking about two more primal stories that each group held. And I think that it still holds what she what she suggested. She did this at around 2016. But, um, and she said that for a lot of the people she talked with at Lake Charles, her image for them was they're standing in a line of people and way up at some point is the American dream at the end of that line. And they're standing there looking forward and the line's not moving. And what they're seeing is they're seeing the government give us cuts in front of them in the line to immigrants, to minorities, right? I mean, that's what they see. Yeah. She also observes what they fail to see is around them all the immigrants and minorities and you know people just like them that are also standing in line at that point and not moving towards the American dream. But they're looking ahead, and that's all that's what they see. And I think mm -hmm. Trump, you know, that's what he was appealing to was that frustration of oh, I'm not getting yeah. it. I'm not, you know. Yeah. So I think she, the, go ahead, please. Can I, the, just yeah, by, yeah. by contrast, because I think it goes to Biden. And I, you know, she, I mean, the problem is, of course, all right, I'm a Democrat. My nephew was elected Speaker of the House in Colorado, um, the Democratic Speaker of the House. So yeah, I've got, I got connections here to go way too deep. But I'm kind of a moderate to conservative Democrat. Um, and, she, and so I resonated with this when she said that on the flip side for uh, more liberal, it, there's people imagining a town square 
with all these people in it, and there's all kinds of races and older and younger and kids playing. And there's a museum and a bookstore and a library and all these cool things around the town square. And what they fear of Trump is that the library gets bought up by Barnes and Noble and the museum uh, gets shut down. And pretty soon the, you know, the vision is kind of the square has decayed, you know, to where, you know, we all have those images of those old squares that are like the trees died and fell over and the swings are, you know, not, not working right and the like. And I thought that was a pretty fair description of what a lot of more liberal folks were feeling with uh, the fear of Trump kind of captured in there of, yeah, but if we do that and go back, then we'll lose all this. And so we had these kind of primal stories running on both sides that I thought was a really interesting. That's very interesting. You know, in agreement with what both of you are saying, I think the whole rural disaffected segment of the population is nevertheless not, I mean, that's, if you take that as a, as an important constituent mm -hmm. and then bring it back to the value proposition, uh, it is true that the Trump campaign spoke directly to them. And whether or not they have delivered is besides the point. They nevertheless said, I feel your pain mm -hmm. and I'm here to do something about it. And if it weren't for these other guys, I would have done more for you. Mm -hmm. Whereas we're not really seeing that from the Democrats. They're not really talking to that disaffected part. They are talking yeah. about, you know, yeah. the, 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 you know, the poor and the, you know, but, but, but not the same segment. So I think that's a really big difference in how the value yeah. propositions get turned into messages. Well, because Democrats say working class. And, you know, I mean, what's really weird is to go like, wait a minute, guys, what does that mean? Right. Like, I made enemies on the Multnomah County Democratic Central Committee when uh, we were going to have our dinner. And they said, well, we have to have it at a union union uh, place, you know, with union servers. I said, oh, well, in Multnomah County, where are those places? Uh, the convention center. I'm like, there's one you think we're going to have this big fundraising dinner and get people great food and we can only go to the union better be worried about this. Well, I didn't make friends, you know, mm -hmm. because I, because mm -hmm. I, you know, it was a inviolable thing, but the reality is the working class. I think the Democrats have failed to evolve their sense of what the working class is. Right. You know, does the working class include the people at Chick-fil-A down the street who are right, exactly. less than asked for not very much money and yeah, they yeah, get exactly. some benefits sure. or, yeah. you know, there's still, there's still this sad thing in the Democratic Party where the unions, you know, they see it as working class means unions, right, kind of a exactly. 1960s vision yeah. um, that, that doesn't encompass that, you know, the people who are disaffected. Right. <laughs> who have very real frustrations. I, I got to read a letter somebody had sent to somebody else justifying their Trump support. And it was really poignant. I mean, full of, for me, it was like, ah, I was you know, irritated. On the other hand, underneath it, I could really sense that frustration of, um, you know, he gets me and nobody well, else has talked about it. Exactly. Me. So here really is a customer segment. Mm -hmm. and whose values and you know buying behavior and pain points as marketing people you're supposed to understand mm -hmm. and there is nevertheless a very visible difference between how they perceive it mm -hmm. so on one side i mean like you were saying mike on one side is make america great again very simple very good message however implying that america is no longer great mm -hmm. so right there you rule out the folks who are puzzled by that message Mm -hmm. and, 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 you, and you appeal to those who are feeling some disaffection. Mm -hmm. And they nevertheless want it to be great again. And they remember the days when it was. Mm -hmm. On the Biden front was the battle for soul of a nation. Mm -hmm. And among other Democrats, that obviously that value proposition prevailed because it turned out that for Democrats, it, it really eventually did become about battle for the soul of a nation mm -hmm. and getting rid of the enemy or getting rid of someone who you perceive to be undermining the pillars of democracy becomes kind of the soul of the nation. So from that standpoint, it was good. But when you translate that to daily messages, that really took very different strategies for both of them. Can, okay. can, I, can I throw somebody into the mix, Shaheen, just as mm -hmm. long as we're there, mm -hmm. which is we're, we're not talking about the, uh, the, oh, the elephant in the room, so to speak. Um, which is Blinken Project, right? Where's, where's Wit? What? 
the Lincoln Project. Lincoln Project, yes, because yes. in a lot of ways, uh, I think they they're the ones that were carrying the water for Biden in 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 very many ways. <laughs> well, right? I have two views on the Lincoln Project. One uh -huh. is that. That was demonstration that sharp, biting advertising marketing can come yes. only from re Republicans uh -huh. <laughs> because they, they they actually went there in places where Democrats somehow yeah. don't seem to be able to. Uh, well, the that's because we're, we're kind and gentle. <laughs> well, yes, uh, for that, when we're not being assholes, but you know, anyway. Well, so. but not according to the other side, right? Oh, I know, uh, I know. Right. Yeah. So, so the, the the other part is a cynical one that I was just reading yesterday that hadn't occurred to me. And somebody was saying that the Lincoln Project was just a strategy to just milk Democrats for money. And it was just a bunch of the Republicans that says, ooh, market opportunity, we're going to go after it. <laughs> so really wasn't about getting rid of Trump. It was like, oh, you know, these Democrats will pay us to do this thing. I, I, I will tell you, because I'm appearing to What's that? On uh, uh, the disaffected and Trump. Uh, he, he recognized what they wanted, and Doug, you pointed it to, and, and he appealed to it. And he has, uh, I think, of any politician or any company with its product, uh, he to them is like the the iPhone to Apple users. They, they can't contemplate a replacement product uh, for it. I think what is happening um, in 2020 is served up uh, with both parties that neither can offer a value proposition that is going to be salient four years out. Uh, the Democrats played it middle of the road and they're going to run into issues with progressives. I think as far as the GOP, uh, I think largely, and I'm speaking in generalities now, I think many of them were surprised, albeit pleasantly surprised that uh, Trump could come in and could command and have, uh, you know, extreme endearing command, uh, loyal command over 40% of the population who was willing to vote Republican to get Trump. Not that all of them, I think, like Republican. I think what the GOP is dealing with now uh, is that uh, Trump represents, it's not the GOP going forward, but it is Trumpism. Uh, it is a different political philosophy. And the GOP is going to have to recast itself. And I, I read and I hear that there are serious questions even going on now with what does the GOP look like going forward? And it has not done much for a lot of America. It has not had a platform. The fact that in the debates before the first debate, the GOP came out and said, well, we got no platform not for whatever he says, count us in. Uh, I think likewise, if Biden does prevail and get in, I don't see it as being a, a peaceful, happy um, return to, to normalcy. Uh, I think there's a sufficient proportion of the population that is looking, if you will, in a market's point of view, for a value uh, that does not exist sufficiently in the marketplace to get a majority uh, of votes. So there are big implications for both um, uh, parties. And I don't know whether one of them is going to experience the innovator's dilemma in, in trying to cast something new. Uh, but I, I mean, the days of two party system, at least for those two stalwarts, uh, I think is coming into um, uh, severe question. And I would also add in too, when it comes, when you take a look at a marketing point of view and the votes you talked about and the swing states and how rural states uh, can each have two senators, uh, like Wisconsin with 550,000 people has the same number of senators as California with its 35 million. Um, but you take a look at the composition of electoral college and those um, swing states. And the reality is from a marketing point of view in terms of purchase, a purchase that's important to you getting electoral votes, the wallets are all different sizes. And it happens that Wisconsin and Pennsylvania and Georgia have very fat wallets uh, when it comes to uh, who's going to get power. But rather than drawing on, I, I just put it out there. I think there's a question for both parties. Do we hold sufficient enough appeal? Do we have a platform that is going to be as attractive to a majority of the voters 
uh, as it was for our predecessors platform, either left or right, you know, before us. I don't think, I don't think they do. In fact, I also don't buy that this was kind of a confirmation of Trumpism. I think what these campaigns did through their messaging and how it has been escalating over the past several decades, and certainly more so in recent years, is that the choice for the voters is now a, an, an existential choice. People yes. are now not suggesting that we might go a little bit here or middle there. It's like the difference between getting my way and death. It's no. like getting, you know, yeah. great greatness or total annihilation. But you know, it's when, so but but wait, yeah. but when when the when the stakes go so high, then mm -hmm. it is no longer a matter of opinion. It's a matter of fact. So then you cannot anymore discuss anything. It's like if you don't agree with this fact, I can't even talk to you. Right, so that kind of an escalation is really finally makes the vote more against the other guy than for anybody. Well, I think okay. So if we go go with marketing the product, I mean, the reality. I did just a tiny bit of advertising when my brother ran for attorney general. You know, I did a little bit of work for him. What I realized is the truth about what we really needed a candidate is we're hiring somebody to be there, and yeah, we buy programs and stuff like that. But we're kind of hiring the person to make judgment calls because nobody even knows in advance all the stuff they're going to learn once they're president that says, right. do I pull the trigger to attack with a drone or do I, what do I do for COVID? We're hiring uh, almost a personality. That's really what we're needing. But we've turned the campaign into, um, you know, kind of buying a thing. We've got like our package on the shelf, you know, saying buy this mm. when that's not really what we need. But core to that package is we convert it over to ideology being everything. This is my, I'm going to give my brief rant. Ideology has become everything. And we're buying ideology in our votes instead of buying pragmatism. And I think that goes on both sides, you know, and I think it, it just it splits us because the challenge is for what we need in government is we need a government that reaches into this thing and says, what's the right thing to do? in this situation and looks at it honestly and decides what to do. And ideology loads us up with baggage that says, I can't look at the situation as it is. I have to look at it, at it through my uh, blue or red colored glasses mm -hmm. to use that you know, analogy. And I think we're, we're kind of in a tough spot right now. Um, you, know, my, you know, because politicians I really do like are the ones that are like, let's find the right answer. You know? Right, exactly. Yeah. You raise a good point. It's it's gotten so it's almost to the point now. If you think like, there's only you walk into a store. There's only two products on the shelf. Mm -hmm. One on the left hand shelf and one on the right hand shelf, and it's like there's um, uh, a product rep from each of the product manufacturers in the store, and mm -hmm. each one has the same pitch. You know, use my product. It's not everything you want, but your alternative is death with this product. Yeah, that's right. If you cross over that line, you know. And that's not, that's, you know, you know we're, we're kidding in a way, but that's not a sustainable value proposition. Uh, yeah. And it's indicative of, and I almost, yeah, I know the, I forget his name, the gentleman on here from the UK, but uh, mm. take a look at similar things right. happening, uh, with Brexit and uh, with Boris and what's been going on in UK for the last um, several years. And it's a similar, similar kind of thing. There's a, uh, a populist anxiety uh, where when we go back to, you know, I think you have to go back before Clinton, but go back 30, 40 years ago. Uh, and the notion of putting forth a platform of what each party is going to do uh, and make a choice. And hopefully it's one with some intellectual reasoning in it. Uh, I think those days are gone. And Shane, you know, your point. What I offer is not exactly what you want, but your alternative is death. So. <laughs> and actually, that really that gets both pitches down into a you know. It's I mean, yeah, it's a good it's, encapsulation. Yeah. As a Democrat, I heard that from the Democratic side. Oh my God, you know, and I, I you know, I'd say, hey, look, I mean, what was it? You know, even when Mitch McConnell came out with his post-election comment, you know, and and you know, the liberal tabloid of Huffington Post you know, hits with a headline that says, oh, my God, you know, and I go off and read it. And what he said is count the votes. And, you know, a candidate has the right to appeal. And, you know, it was fairly mild what he actually said. But the whole world went, 
ballistically crazy trying to convince me that you know um he was he was wanting the downfall of the modern right, right. well this kind of a positioning also plays well into the media <laughs> who have an interest <laughs> sorry but if you haven't seen valdis's comment um <laughs> go check the chat <laughs> right so uh when you when you this kind of a messaging plays into the media and their profit motive and therefore and of course mm -hmm. in media conflict sells mm -hmm. and and any sort of conflict so they have an incentive by you know implicit or explicit to position it like that and that i think is another fuel on the fire that mm -hmm. th that becomes now a confluence of bad things that are happening mm -hmm. and you know for those of you who have seen this movie social dilemma it it speaks to the importance of what we consume as data and after a while it just manipulates us i do say with, like with that i i do um john i do like uh parliamentary systems where you have like two weeks of campaigning i mean the idea of that at least i mean i don't know if that's reality but you know the idea of not having because how long have we been going through this i mean geez two years now of uh, or the campaign is rather longer than two weeks here, but I, I, there is a fixed length. I'm not <laughs> it's a couple of months, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm not a, I'm not into the politics of all this, obviously, because I'm <laughs> elsewhere. But I'm just interested to listen to you guys and how you understand these things. But I, just one thing, I think in the UK there's a sense that there's a chunk of people who really don't trust politicians at all. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, and polit politics doesn't really attract people <laughs> who are particularly nice anyway. But um, and so there's a sense that people vote for the person they think is least likely to screw it up, you know. So if you can convince them that the death they'd have with the other party is worse than anything you could do to them, you know, that might be, you know, one line. Vote for us, we'll only torture you. <laughs> so it this comes leads to, to Doug's point, sorry, but Doug's point about not knowing what they're going to face uh, in advance and what decisions they're going to have to make. But if you can sort of make some judgment about whether they'll more or less likely to screw it up than the other guy. I think that might be a Yeah, I think that's exactly what I see too, is that there's a lot of vote against the other guy. And when you think of it that way, they're not ratifying anything. Yeah. They're, you know, they, 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 right? They're, they're just saying bad guy, okay guy, right? Well, that's right, love. I, I got into some arguments about will of the people, you know, because we, you know, kind of the American mythology is that <laughs> vote represents the will of the people. Uh, and I'm kind of, see you, see you, Leah, thanks. Um, you know, when I think about that, I'm like, does this really represent the will? Of the, I mean, so basically what this guy said, well, because uh, the Senate Republicans are in charge, therefore what they do is the will of the people. And I'm like, you know, the will, no, of, the people, in charge, the, you know? the will of the people always reminds me in the corporate context when I heard the field wants. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, so now I say, okay, who in the field wants? I mean, Mike would know this more intimately than I You never I heard that, Mike, I'm sure, did you? <laughs> but, I'm you know, when you... <laughs> uh, I always said that, the, that, that what you hear from the field is whatever lost the salesman their last sale. <laughs> they didn't even know what the field would want, but if I lost a sale, it must be that, you know. That's it. <laughs> so, Shaheen, uh, you know, based on, uh, you know, what John Lewis offered up a couple of minutes ago, but you know, at the end of the day, no one really trusts any politician, and uh, which is the lesser of two evils that you want to live with. And what you'd raised earlier about um, you know, the spend and how do you measure performance, you know, gets to another question that you raised. Uh, how did the freaking polling get so far yes. off? Uh, well, I, I read, I actually heard uh, two days ago, with that question in mind, uh, the best explanation yet as to why they got it wrong from a died in the wool uh, GOP pollster. And he offered this up. Uh, he said that Trump's base was undercounted. And that's why uh, the, uh, the polls got it wrong. How did they get undercounted? Yeah. You need to understand going back even four years ago, uh, even before leading up to the 2016 election, one of the things Trump has been saying to his base, don't believe the polls. They're constructed by the deep state, by the lamestream media. Do not trust the polls. And his view is he conditioned his base uh, to believe that not only were polls inaccurate, 
but if polls are inaccurate, why should you participate in them? So his conclusion from what he observed and for people he talked to, for people who were polled, who were definitely, uh, you know, they're wearing mega hats and mega cufflinks. There's no question as to uh, where they were headed. Many from his base declined to be polled when they were called. They passed it. So you, you didn't get that representative um, uh, vote. And I don't know, to his point, how you control for that in another election, they, they don't, they're not able to figure out how to do it. Right. But that's likely because they didn't want to be counted because they didn't trust the pollsters as much as they don't trust politicians. May I, may I ask, is there another segment of people who didn't want to admit to be uh, Trump voters? Oh, here's the, and yeah, here's the, I, what's interesting, so I did some, digger, some de digging, I'm glad you did the budgets because I went off in the poll world, which is, you know, I love market research. But um, David Shore, who's a uh, pollster more on the Democratic side, but he observed, and I think there's two things. And one of what he what he does, I think, provide us a little clarity around what you're suggesting, Mike, which is uh, that he uh, had an article on Vox. I've got a I'll drop a, a presentation over here before we're done. Um, where he said that they found that um, the people who take a poll have a higher level of what he qualified as social trust. So in broadly, it's a social trust. And he said, that's actually always been true. But it didn't matter until 2016 and 2020 when we had a candidate who played off of that, right? So Donald Trump, I mean, in other words, people who would, didn't have that level of social trust would split kind of 50-50 between the parties. And so it didn't really affect the polling. Uh, Once slight. you have Donald Trump out there, it shifted them all off into, into that side. So and what he noted, for example, is they can match their survey takers with other databases now. So they started finding that a high percentage were Act Blue donors. You know, a higher percentage of the people responding to surveys were act blue donors, for example. Yeah. The question that John just raised, you know, who wanted to put their hand up in the air and actually declare, you know, I, I can only comment on this anecdotally. I don't know whether you observed it um, on Facebook, Shaheen, because you and I are many of the same circle. But <laughs> yes. I noticed in uh, from August, well, actually earlier in August, certainly August, September, uh, people very, uh, very strident in stating their view, pro-Trump, uh, mm -hmm. pro-Biden, uh, and a lot of stuff was being exchanged and a lot of emotion. But I noticed come October that people, at least struck me, being uh, the number of political comments, you know, here's where I stand, here's where I started to really drop off. And I don't know why. It, Maybe you and I hit the wrong friends. I don't know, but um, <laughs> but just I noticed there was really a reluctance, uh, and I don't know whether it was because people didn't want to show their colors, as John asked, or it was becoming so emotionally laden um, that people, the social trust. Can I state how I feel in front of my friends? I thought I could in July, but now it seems really serious. Mm -hmm. And no matter who gets elected, I still want to be able to associate with this person. But I, I just noticed that, I mean, people would point to what was going on in the media or here, but I found very few people came out and would actually state a view as strongly and as frequently as they would 120 days earlier. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of that's true. I think the other thing that, and I, by the way, I posted, I put together a little presentation around this just because I had to clear my thoughts and uh, uh, figure it out. Um, so I posted it in the chat over there. Um, but so Short went on, though, to say that the assumption or that he said that, um, you know, essentially people will answer. And so people giving bullshit answers, it, he doesn't, and I, all my market research experience, I don't believe that people would re refuse on the phone to admit that they were voting for Trump because it's a very private thing. But I could see the social, general social value. I'm not doing that kind of thing. But I think it's gotten worse because of the polling mechanisms, right? How do you contact people these days? And we went through 70 blissful years where it was the phone, 
you know, stable and we could uh, rely on phone statistics and project to a total you know, population. Now it's the, well, which phone, landline or cell phone hmm. or email survey or a polling uh, survey or the online polling um, pool or and all of a sudden we've got a place where it could be that each individual is only reachable in one of four or five different ways. And so that has put on the pollsters a really nasty thing because the key underlying assumption on polls, right, is that you can pick, you can talk to a sample of the market that represents the total market. And this is what all market research is about is we're finding a sample that represents the total market. But now that we have all these different polling mechanisms, we have people who aren't willing to talk to us. Um, we've made it worse as marketers because we've added, you know, we do, or the campaigns do push polling, which is fake polling. Consumers do not like that. You know, we know from consumer research that if you aren't asking serious questions, you do not get good answers. So if you ask consumers a question they think is kind of bullshit, you know, like, you know, uh, something frivolous about their kitchen, they're going to take that and go, these people aren't really wanting my opinion, so I'm not going to give it to them. Mm -hmm. um, so with all that, I think we actually, I think we may be finding a problem that you cannot get a good sample now. And uh, I don't know that that's going to fix going forward. If you can't get a good sample, then you don't really have a good way to adjust it for who's a likely voter and who's going to go to the polls or all those things that used to be done. So we're out of that period of stability. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if we aren't going to continue to have poll problems. And um, they skewed both ways in some sense, you know, that there were some things like if you look at Maine, I think it is Biden way outperformed in one area and Trump way outperformed in another area. You know, Maine is one of the few states that splits its electoral votes. Yeah. Yeah. So we get right. that kind of detail from Maine because it's splitting the electoral votes. So actually, no, I think what, what uh, Nate Silver observed was the Susan Collins versus, you know, if you look at Susan Collins versus Trump and everything, it doesn't actually all make sense with the polls. Mm. So they kind of erred in both directions. So I think the, the idea that is purely a, um, you know, that is purely a Republican you know, like undercounting Trump, I think that makes sense with the social trust question. But in general, I think we have a much more serious problem with polling, which affects all of us in our jobs, because it's a much more serious thing when it comes to market research. You know, I think about companies doing the stuff they're doing. Well, you know, we do social media listening. Hmm. What's the skew in who's active on social media? Uh, er, uh, you know, I mean, my favorite kind of, you know thing on social media is we often did a project for Festool, makes high-end finished carpentry saws, um, and we went out and did testimonial work. And so we talked to all these people that were just peak, peak craftsmen. And then they got us their best social media, you know, interactor. And we talked to this guy, and he was a yokel handyman. The absolutely lowest skilled guy we talked to was the guy who's most active on their social media site. So it's always given me this pause like, boy, we as companies have got to be a lot more careful what we're listening to, because if we're only using cell phones, what are we missing? If we're only using mail surveys, what are we missing? You know, when you said 70 years of bliss with the stability of the telephone, a couple of things come to mind is one is I was getting text message pitches for an out of state campaign, which had no relevance to me. I don't know how I got on that list. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, um, during those 70 blissful years of landlines, uh, you knew somebody's area code, you knew exactly where they lived. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. And now people have a smartphone, and they move across the country and they keep their phone number. So you may be uh, deluding yourself as to like who you're actually reaching. Sure, I, get, I get student phone calls but from class. <laughs> I have to look at like, what's 809? Where's that phone? <laughs> but Doug, here's a question. Yeah. So. 2016, they got it wrong, and we could say, ooh, okay, good excuse, first time, a lot of things changed. 2018, they looked good again, and they've had four years to kind of fix it, and 2020, they're now even worse than they were in 2016. So why is it that they have not put steps, you know, they've taken steps to make up for these well, variations? There, there are times when you can't fix the measurement. 
I'm gonna, and I'm going to suggest the radical idea. I know this right. is a little bit of a headline thing here, you know, but right. Um, right. But I'm not sure that it's fixable. That we haven't entered into a kind of a type of complexity. I mean, what made those 70 years simple is we had one connection. Andrew's right. We knew what state they were in. We knew where you know there was all sorts of stuff we knew because of the phone, the landline connected to the wall. And now we don't know that we have gone from one method to eight methods which introduces, you know, the, the kind of the multiplication of connect, you know, like what are the possible screw ups. Hmm. So I'll just suggest we may not ever be able to get back to where we were. Um, the other yeah, part is we have also that... through the news, went to one last second, through the news, risen our expectations of polls to be accurate, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of the big data thing. Well, we have all this, we've got to be perfect now. Right, right. Uh, and Mike, I need your forecast to 10 significant digits, please. You know. <laughs> really? Sorry, John, go ahead. I was just gonna say, are you saying that uh, they might well have been taking steps and trying to, to improve, but the situation was getting more difficult faster than they could keep up yeah. with? Yeah, well, that's my take. I think I they, okay. you know, they worked really hard on it and it still didn't really. Didn't so now let me take it way to the other end of the spectrum because yeah. nate silver was quoted as saying by the time all the votes are counted you will see that the polls are accurate in 48 to 49 states mm -hmm. which is a pretty incredible measure of accuracy right so maybe the polls were not as bad as presented because the game wasn't over yet i i think that's true too but you know you still look at it and uh you know what was the swing in uh in uh you know so when he said that, what he's meaning is that it was accurate in the, you know, um, Biden was predicted to win Wisconsin, Biden uh -huh. won Wisconsin. But the detail is Biden was predicted to win Wisconsin by 8.3%. Mm -hmm. And he's winning mm -hmm. Wisconsin by 0.6. Yeah, I actually have the list here. In Ohio, yeah. Trump won by 8.2. The mm -hmm. poll error was 8.2. Mm -hmm. In Florida, Trump won by 3.3. .3. Poll error was 6.6. .6. Michigan... Well, Error was six point four. I was back to Maine. That Maine More. District Two, the error was eleven points. That's um, amazing, right? Yeah, yeah. Which are you know well, and it goes back to right. It, sorry, this is my last thing on polls. You know, I get excited. No, this um, was we were looking for the, your part. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. So, um, you know, when it reports that plus or minus two percent, plus or minus three percent, there's huge assumptions that go into that statistical accuracy, such as the sample was valid. The questions were understood by the by the person answering them, and we're interpreting it all correctly, right? There's all these assumptions. If the sample's wrong, the plus or minus three percent is bullshit. You enter into a world of plus or minus a hundred percent, and if the question's not understood right, you know, which isn't a problem in polling because they really understand those, but in marketing research, oh lord, I've seen these surveys, and you know, it comes to me, we know this, and I look at the survey and I'm like, oh lord your customer didn't understand what you were asking because you used your own marketing speak to ask it or you know for some variety of reasons yeah definitely so Are you... that's where i think you look at these and you look at those numbers so a plus or minus so an 11 mm percent -hmm. error is far beyond margin of error right in poll. but 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 mm -hmm. you know for for the polling industry if there is yeah. such an industry for them to get it this wrong again this time mm -hmm. is a really big deal this is going to impact yeah. the revenue mm -hmm. So don't you think that would have caused them to want to fix it and try to put fudge factors here? And I mean, Trafalgar did some of that. Their polls were a little more accurate than others. They, I, think they, I think they were. I haven't seen the final on Trafalgar. But yeah, I think, um, I don't know. I'm waiting to see more as it mm. comes out. I think that we'd have to be, we have to be open to the idea that it's changed enough that maybe we don't have a communications environment where polling can sample as accurately as we used to. And I want to make a comment on just from a data standpoint, because we're, I mean, polling is data. Mm -hmm. What we're counting is also data and we haven't completed counting. Mm -hmm. And obviously that counting is not pristine either. Like when was the last time Florida did anything with less than 5% <laughs> shenanigans, right? So- Butterfly and, ballots and hanging chats. <laughs> exactly, they're the ones who introduced us. So. I think I find it kind of intellectually, philosophically interesting that we use one set of data to question another set of data. And they're both data. 
and their you know their their their, their provenance and their accuracy and their relevance and their completeness and their reproducibility and all those it's not you know well except the, I mean, maybe see, i'm just thinking shaking the significant difference is the poll is a small subset of data you know 5000 people yes yes i call it the Whereas bread what exam we're trying to project to is the 150 million yeah 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 i mean i and i i think i heard it someplace that the poll is like a blood exam they mm -hmm. obviously can't drain all of your blood to give you the accurate <laughs> count so they need to get a sample and they're hoping that that sample is representative mm -hmm. and if they really know what they're looking for they ask you to fast for 12 hours mm -hmm. so <laughs> now we're saying that people have refused to fast nobody's fasting anymore Right. So all these lipid exams are out the door because every blood test is wrong mm -hmm. because people are just not going to fast. You know? Well, or the margins are worse, or maybe we're in that world. The other Nate Silver comment I love is he said, uh, you know, he talked to economists and said, well, how accurate are you like your GDP predictions? And they said, well, if we're predicting a 1% growth, it's accurate to within plus or minus four points off of that. <laughs> and he's like, you mean it could be a growth of 5% or a loss of 3%? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that's right, it. Right. He's like, why don't you ever publish those? They said, do you think we'd ever get work? <laughs> well, speaking wow. of work, the other cynical comment is that the polling industry has an interest in showing neck and neck mm -hmm. because that's usable for fundraising. It's like, oh, we're coming within two points of McConnell. If you just get these two more million dollars, you can win mm -hmm. it, right? Well, and that's the other thing that's happened to credibility of polls and trust in polls is that there's a lot of abuse of them. I mean, I, you know, it, it, come on, we're in the marketing business. We're as bad as anybody. Like I see these, you know, a, a brand new venture comes out and there's some poll done, some study done by some organization that says everybody is going to have a connected house and they're going to be turning their lights from blue to green. <laughs> everybody, 100% of the population. Yeah. You're like... Can I read the details behind it? You read the details behind it, and you go, this is bullshit. But we're, you know, we're getting pummeled with research that is um, not for neutral reasons. Right, right, right. Okay, let's go to loyalty programs. Uh, one of the things that was interesting was that uh, was all the all the stuff that they give you, these campaigns, that if you if you join this class, so they've got tiers of membership, right? Don't they? I mean, I didn't subscribe to any of them because I was fearful. But for those of you who have done that, what do they offer in terms of the loyalty program, a frequent voter program, so to say? Frequent voter program, that's good. You know what they could have offered me? Stop sending me emails. I signed <laughs> up for Biden's weekly for the last month and a half of the campaign. I said, yeah, I'll give a weekly amount. And I kept getting the freaking emails, you know. <laughs> yes, I, I do think their email, but their email campaigns are out of control. Yes, we but were, by the way, I, you know, joking about frequent voter program, Andrew. We were joking a few years ago that maybe as a country we should offer a frequent voter program. And when you're like 18, your vote counts like one. But if you keep voting, that there will be a modest increase in the impact of your votes. And if you've voted uninterrupted for 10 years, it counts like 1.25. You know, not like a giant inflation, but just enough to incentivize you to vote more. <laughs> I was thinking more in terms of Chicago. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> early and often, right? <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> I can tell you from uh, the GOP or Trump's perspective in terms of loyalty program, uh, it was more like uh, less loyalty and more like a memorabilia uh, uh, and a prominence program in that, as Doug said, I, I, I didn't contribute um, money um, one cent to anybody's uh, campaign, <laughs> like out of fear, as you said, uh, Shaheen. But uh, Trump's offered a host of them, but uh, I mean, there's a lot of uh, apparel that he even offered, uh, you know, 25% off. Uh, when they're going for the serious money, uh, you could wind up getting uh, the gold and platinum Trump card saying I'm the Trump supporter with your name on it, carry it in your wallet. And uh, in case of accident, uh, paramedics could take a look and decide whether they wanted to transport you to the hospital or not. <laughs> um, um, the looking autographed football, uh, why I would want an autographed football from Trump, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure he's ever played the game. Um, and a variety, um, um, 
uh, autographs and things actually from a lot of his uh, family and extended families. I got to tell you with his email campaign, I think I found interesting out of the 2,700 and it's now 2,778 emails since I've been on this call. But uh, there are a variety of authors or they, uh, they substituted every member of his family except Baron, nothing from Baron, every member of his family, uh, most of which came from uh, Eric, um, from Lara Trump, uh, from Kimberly Guilfoyle. And I could tell what they were doing from like, if, you know, if, if you're not responding to our emails on Donald, maybe we offer somebody else here, you can you know, feel better. Uh, I, so there were calendars, um, uh, a Trump uh, you know, calendar just to see you know, with him and Melania on it, to see the exit of 2020, I guess, um, and, and a host of other things, but the, to the point Doug raises, uh, I think it'd be pretty clear to all of us, if you, um, uh, make a contribution to a political campaign. It's the same thing as getting hooked on heroin. Um, <laughs> the, the street peddlers are going to be at, at your door trying to give you a fix each and every time. Uh, and loyalty was just really a matter, less loyalty and, and more recognition. So you'd be willing. I mean, all they wanted was your money and your vote, right. but they really wanted your money. The only people worse than the campaigns is Oregon Public Broadcasting. <laughs> because once you get on their list, they sell it to every other nonprofit in town. Oh, nice. <laughs> Sorry. That's a, no, it, uh, it, it is kind of, I think it's like they discovered the power of email marketing and digital stuff, but they didn't learn the restraint yet. That is, you know, you cycle lists, you take people, you know, there's, I mean, all those aging things. I mean, the people who run full direct marketing campaigns, are really smart about how you manage that. But. Well, you know, we should do another session just on data privacy and the impact of that on marketing people. Yeah. But oh, we are at 12.27 now. Just Go one ahead. quick thing I forgot, Please, which yeah. I thought Trump did, they did several times leading up to uh, the debates, but where they offered it, you would enter a promotion to uh, join uh, him and 500 others at some dinner or something uh, they would fly you and someone else if you won the thing in a draw uh, out to uh, one of his uh, rallies, as long as you promise not to wear a face mask, uh, but a variety of things like this. So I, I wouldn't call them, I think, Shaheen, uh, loyalty, because you had to pay for, for everything, but more of, um, I mean, what you got returned was the opportunity to, uh, give more money and, you know, get, get some kind of, it's not like an Amex program, but some form of recognition or memorabilia from it. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yes. Uh, 1228. Anybody who didn't make a comment who wants to want to say something now before we kind of start wrapping? I just want to say thank you. This is one of the best marketing panels I've attended in a very long time. And a quick comment about direct mail. Canadian marketers can only listen in utter amazement. We cannot do any of that here anymore. You cannot put a database together and send to it. And this, the government, when they introduced the legislation, they set very steep fines. And some of the big companies like Bell Canada broke them and they got hit with fines of 60, 70, $80,000 and even more. I think I heard somebody got like a $200,000 fine. So here you can, email marketing in that regard is gone. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot of that stuff I feel like, God, I really wish the US, I mean, it goes against our fundamental you know, approach, you. But, but you know, it's <laughs> kind of it's kind of the health uh, the health of the business that you know. I don't know if it's I mean, we, that would be a whole yes. That's a whole other one. Okay, we can talk about whether that should be regulated. Anyhow, thank you all. What a pleasure. Goodbye. Thank you all. All right. Well, thank you so much. Until later. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. It's fun. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Mike. Have a, thanks. Take care, Doug. All right. Thanks so much.